beautiful benefits of studying this together, studying how to form equitable societies, harmonious communities, how to live with loving kindness and goodwill in our hearts towards one another, and to have that sense of inclusivity, diversity among us. And as the Buddha says, the most uh, important ways to come together that lead to harmony are things like shared views, shared um, ways of understanding the world that lead to a release of suffering, that lead to naturally establishing beautiful motivations and ways of relating to the world. You know, when we understand that all beings suffer, suffering is not something personal. It's not something that happens because we've done something wrong or we've, you know, been a bad person. It's something that we have to inevitably face by being born. You know, birth was the cause of suffering at its deepest level. Of course, we can go back and say delusion is the cause of birth. But we're born. There's nothing we can do. And now we can learn to respond to that suffering in ways that increase it or in ways that gradually undermine the root causes of suffering and even help us use that suffering to live more compassionate, loving, gentle, wise lives. So suffering is a part of life and it's part of what we have to work with. And by turning toward that suffering, in all its various forms. Some people don't like the word suffering. Personally, I think it's great. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, you can say, oh, things are unsatisfactory, but I wouldn't say death is simply unsatisfactory. Breaking your leg, you know, going through labor pains, is it unsatisfactory? It hurts. It's suffering, you know, in its rawest form, you know, having the loss of a loved one, having your heart broken. This is suffering. Let's be honest about this. And I think, you know, even the milder forms of suffering kind of stand out as something that is not um, not to be kind of delighted in, let's say, the more peace we develop in our hearts. You know, it's a relative thing. Yeah? And the more we um, move towards a path that's free from suffering, gradually, incrementally, through cultivating wholesome states, then the more it's easy to turn away from those things that before... Um, felt like something useful, something pleasant. We get a, a finer, more refined taste for what happiness and peace really mean. But anyway, before I get into right view and give a whole talk on right view, <laughs> um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about my plans for this evening. And uh, people are still entering. Well, firstly, Venerable Apec is here, as you can see, and we also have Venerable Satima, who's sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. who's another Samana. Uh, she's a Samaneri, so a novice, training, hopefully, towards full bikini ordination, if those conditions come together for her, and it's really delightful to have you here, and um, yeah, to experience your gentle, and calm presence, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you know, it's just so lovely to actually see harmonious community develop. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd go through a little bit of what we've learned, what we've looked at in each chapter, very briefly, and then perhaps open for some comments, some feedback, some discussion, before posing a few questions to get you to think and see how some of these teachings can be applied in ways that can help us in our lives and maybe have helped you in your life already. And then we'll come back to the main group. And uh, you can share what you've discussed together. So, uh, yeah, I think I'll begin. So I just made a few little notes, partly based on the epilogue in the book, but I didn't want to read it all out. I thought that might feel a bit dry, but rather put some of it in my own words and maybe highlight certain things that seem important. So I think it kind of goes without saying, and yet it really needs to be said that the Dhamma is to be applied. It's not a dogma. It's not a formula. It's not something that works on its own. It's something that works in relationship, both to ourselves and to our societies, our communities. It's something that has to be applied. And the Buddha talked about the Dhamma sometimes as a medicine and uh, I remember my first teacher, Goenka, after my first retreat, it was a, a lovely example that made us all laugh. He said, it's like um, 
you know, somebody gives you medicine, the doctor gives you medicine, and instead of swallowing the pill, you go back home, you put it on your shrine, and you start reciting the formula. You start going two pills in the morning, one pill in the afternoon, two, three pills in the evening, then you pay respect and you do the whole thing again. Two pills in the morning, one pill in the afternoon. <laughs> And, you know, it's funny because this is what we often do with our lives, isn't it? We think we know these teachings just by reading them or we think, you know, well, I know what to do. I can do it later. But if you don't take the medicine, it simply won't have the healing effects. It won't alleviate your disease. So um, this is, you know, something that can be applied to the complexities of life. And I think there's great scope for creativity and for a lot of joy and fun in trying to do this, so long as we're willing to make mistakes. And making those mistakes is part of growth on the path. And uh, this understanding, again, related to right view, that suffering is both personal, it's a personal problem, you know, we construct it by the way we relate to the world, usually in unskillful ways. But it's also socially constructed, yeah? So no individual lives apart from society. It's impossible. Sometimes people think, I'm sick of society. I want to join a monastery and get away from everybody, get away from the world. But that's impossible and actually not something the Buddha advised. So he established the monastic community and um, in a way that, caused us to have to be dependent on the lay community as well so that we could provide them teachings, but so that the lay community could keep us in check in a sense, could scrutinize the conduct of the monastics, hopefully to learn from it, to emulate it, but also to give feedback if something was going wrong. And of course, the um, life of an alms mendicant also gives uh, other people the opportunity to give to be generous, to share whatever resources they have in the way the Buddha said that we should do even among ourselves as lay people. You know, in the last uh, sutta we read, it was about uh, establishing an equitable society. And he was saying that if you have a lot of wealth, if you're a king or a wheel-turning monarch, then you should see that if there are people without trade and give them trade, if there are people without food, give them food. You know, no matter which caste they're from, no matter whether they're like you, whether they're noble, whether they're ignoble, in other words, doing uh, unwholesome things still, we should care for one another, we should share our resources equally and evenly wherever there's a need. And of course, the society is created by individuals, it's a co creation. And uh, that's very clear to me here. You know, there's no way we could have established a monastery <laughs> just through the efforts of one person alone, no matter how mighty that person might be. You know, Ajahn Brahm um, has a very strong, um, I have no idea how much good karma behind him, powerful good karma, but he can't do this alone. I can't do this just as his representative or, you know, based on my own qualities. We need each other. To, to create community. And this particular monastery has had the input of probably tens of thousands of people, I would say, from all over the world, whether that's just with a word of encouragement or a donation, small, large, or in between, you know, offering help in various ways, voluntary help, um, coming to the sutta class, you know, making your presence felt by developing the Dhamma inside you and sharing that energy with all of us here. All of these are ways of establishing community. Even if you live alone, you're not. You're not. You're connected. You know, you can draw on this, I hope, at any given time. So the Buddha took this egalitarian position, you know, and his vision included all beings from different castes. In fact, Castes became irrelevant. When you entered the Sangha, you entered a community where um, your worth, your value was evaluated, if you like, by the goodness of your conduct and the level of your understanding of the Dhamma, and also by how long you've been in robes. In other words, there's something respect worthy simply about the renunciation. And this outweighs 
whatever social status you had in the past. You know, I always find it a little bit strange. And I guess I don't want to criticize individuals because there may be reasons they do this. But sometimes it's a bit strange to me that even after ordaining, some monastics call themselves Dr. Venerable such and such or Venerable Doctor such and such. (laughs) Because actually we try and leave those worldly, um, um, what would you call them, titles aside. And I mean, some of you might think venerable is a title. It's not really meant to be, but it's meant to be a beautiful way of address between monastics and also from the lay community to monastics. And really what it's saying is that what we've done, what a person has done by renouncing is worthy of veneration. So, you know, this is not some kind of uh, status. It's not that we leave the lay world and we become elevated as better than others, of course, in the sense of supported by the Dhamma, supported by the Sangha. Hopefully our morals, our virtue becomes more refined. But it's about humility, you know, first and foremost. And that humility enables us to live with others and uh, hear other people's views and um, try to learn, you know, try to be in a position of a learner as long as we haven't got right view, we haven't attained to right view as an area. So in this book, we began with right view. And I think that's a very wise place for Bhikkhu Bodhi to begin. Of course, he's incredibly uh, wise and learned in the suttas, but also the Buddha spoke of right view as the first chain or the first link in the Noble Eightfold Path, the first step, if you like. And uh, there is that right view that is still um, preliminary in people who have not uh, penetrated to the view of non-self. And this is where most of us, well, we all have to begin, unless we're already born as a stream winner. Some of us might be. We wouldn't necessarily know. But, uh, But that right view is something that's refined over time. And then the next chapter that we looked at was about personal training, which again, highlights the importance of um, doing our own personal development in order to create uh, harmonious societies. You know, everybody thinks they know how. Everyone has their own opinions. They know how everybody else should act. But if we haven't ourselves tried to undermine the greed, the hate, the delusion in our hearts, we're not going to be very efficient at creating um, harmonious societies in which we can live. So personal training is at the heart of the Buddha's path. And, you know, the first step in that is learning to take responsibility for our actions of body, speech, and mind. Um, In a way, you could say that the first responsibility we have as human beings is to live virtuous lives. We're capable of doing it. You know, there's a training to help us to do it. We have the opportunity. And the beautiful thing is we have a sort of inner compass that tells us when something's off. You know, we can feel it when we've been unkind, we feel contracted, we feel kind of a little bit diminished because we know it's not our best, it's not the best we can be, you know. And this um, can be used to help encourage us rather than to lead to any blame or guilt but never encourage blame and guilt. They're unwholesome states of mind, but we can pick ourselves up and try again. And really underlying the uh, practice of virtue again is these beautiful right motivations of loving kindness, compassion, uh, non-harm, an attitude of non-violence, which means really being gentle with our body and minds and also gentle with our speech. So we talked a lot, and it was one of the most popular and uh, long-winded chapters on dealing with anger through this, um, the course of these classes or discussions, uh, because anger is one of those things that's most uh, disruptive to harmony. You know, anger is something that's very obvious, very obviously unpleasant, very obviously harmful, and in that way, it's in a sense easier to remove, easier to start to um, work with. And we can work with that through loving kindness again. And also by learning right speech, you know, how to speak at a proper time, to speak from a mind of loving kindness, to speak gently, to speak about what's for one's benefit or harm. 
not just to speak about anything, you know, that's kind of wasting other people's time or um, kind of give a lot of importance to fairly trivial things, you know, especially if you're giving feedback. Try to focus on things that are really important for another person's growth. And um, what's the other one? To speak a timely, gentle, with a mind of meta, and of course, what's true. Yeah. So gentle, not harsh, and speak the truth as far as we can. And sometimes the truth is a work in progress, isn't it? You know, sometimes we think we're speaking the truth, but we're actually withholding information. And then is it really the full truth? Is it really the whole picture that we're giving someone else? You know, so as we get to know our motivations more and more, we can actually be a lot more honest to that and honest to others as well. And then we spoke about good friendship as a vitally important factor of the path. And uh, there are many famous sitters, but just to remind you of the most kind of famous in the text, I guess, is the one where the Buddha says, that anybody, um, that basically good friendship is the whole of the spiritual path, which means without good friendship, there is very little likelihood of being able to practice the path, right? Because we're going to get misled, we're going to go off course. And at an even deeper level, we need uh, an enlightened person to, how to explain, to kind of give us another view because they've had a paradigm shift in their view. And there's no way we could actually um, break through to that without the guidance of another, the word of another. And as such, that's one of the factors that's necessary for stream winning. One factor is um, one's own investigation, going back to the source, um, sometimes called uh, uh, wise attention. Yoniso Manasikara, but it really means the work of the mind that goes back to the cause of things, right? Understanding the cause and effect and the word of another, which means the word of an area and ideally the word of a, the Buddha. And this is, I think, why we're here, you know, to actually hear uh, the Dhamma as perfect and pure as you can ever hear it in this world from the Buddha himself. And that's why it's been preserved and passed down for so long, because it's something so precious and rare. And uh, all of us have this in our lives. We have the Buddha as our spiritual friend. And hopefully we all have spiritual companions too that we can um, go to, to encourage us. Uh, we can check our understanding with them. We can ask for clarification, for advice. Um, and also look up to someone as an example. And we're never going to find all those qualities in one person but everyone has something we can respect and admire. And sometimes people have, you know, harmful behaviors and we can also learn from that. We can look into the causes for that rather than judging the person. Well, this person might be tired, you know, in that case, what can I do to give more support to make sure they are more resourced, you know, so they can also be their best. They can show up uh, well for others. So instead of judging, we support one another. And, um, this helps, of course, to live happily and that happiness and harmony in community then um, provides a sense of safety, belonging and peace that makes it easy to go off into solitude, feeling glad about one's life, feeling unbothered, you know, not having many regrets and uh, feeling you're in a supportive place to practice. And then we also looked at disputes and settling disputes, which was two other really meaty chapters um, that took quite some time to go through and eventually establishing that equitable society. But essentially, the whole um, thrust of the training is to move away bit by bit from unwholesome states and move towards the wholesome states of mind, which are expressed through body and through speech in our day to day lives. So all of us have that yearning for peace, for safety, for belonging, you know, for a loving connection with those we live with. And uh, the spiritual friendship is the purest of all. So it would be nice to, um, you know, be able to live with others with different views and to be able to um, 
not only tolerate, but really have a sense of mutual respect. Sometimes we don't see eye to eye. And one of my uh, questions, actually, that I think would be maybe interesting for us to discuss is about um, how we can learn to live in peace and cooperate with people that do hold different views. I'm sure that's probably um, something each of you faces in your life. In a monastery, it's slightly easier, but not always. Even monastics have different views about the essence of the Dhamma, you know, whether consciousness persists or whether consciousness too is subject to cessation, whether the Buddha used another word for consciousness in some way that transcends uh, vijnana as a kanda. And there's lots of heated debates around that. There's heated debates around um, the place of calm and insight, whether these two go together grow together and develop together or grow separately through different methods, et cetera. Um, And of course, there's the Buddha's advice on um, trying to have companionship with those who do hold similar views. So um, it would be interesting to hear more about that and maybe discuss that in our little groups. There's not many people here, but I'm still hoping we can kind of get together in threes possibly. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, ish. And maybe Gunter's one of our co hosts, but maybe you'd like to join a group. I think some of you can, even, yeah, I think most people can, except the vid- video recorder, isn't it? Or the group person themselves, maybe. Um, I don't know if you want me and Venerable Rebecca in your group, probably not, because then it might inhibit the conversation. So we might uh, leave that aside <laughs> and we'll just wait and look forward to your feedback. So um, before we do this, does anyone have anything they'd like to um, say or ask or reflect on, first of all? You are very quiet so far. Maybe Venable Pekka? Anything else you remember or that stands out from this book? Um, well, Dhamma is very profound generally when you turn open a, open a Nikaya, you fall into the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and then inside. But this book, I think, has been, oh, can we, okay. Okay. Uh, this book has been just so down to earth and practical because for most of us, that's where we are. Dealing with other people seems to be our greatest misery. <laughs> and um, dealing with our emotions, dealing with our um, society, how society should be, because that's where that's where we are most of the time. So these are, uh, for me, and this this is a much more useful book than sometimes uh, reading more profound suttas because that's where where I'm at anyway. <laughs> that's where most of us are at. So yeah, yeah. yes. Mm. Applying it at the end of the day, you can know everything under the sun, but applying it is an entirely different matter. <laughs> Yeah. So what do you think, people? If there's no comments from the group, shall we do our little groups and you can meet each other and talk about some of these things? And also, there's a few little questions I had noted down, but I don't want to kind of overwhelm anyone. We could actually give you quite some time together to discuss them. And it can really be, I mean, the the questions are kind of, Um, an invitation you know there's some way for you to start that might kind of um, stimulate some discussion but if that's not what you want to discuss that's perfectly fine as well it'll be just really interesting to hear what these things have meant to you how they've helped you in your lives and um, maybe just stimulate some more inquiry so shall I write down the question in the chat and then probably we should have done this in the beginning And then uh, you can have these as invitations. There's actually more than one. So um, 
Perhaps I'll just take a minute to write them all down and then you can give it all a go. What do you think? I'm not hearing any responses, so it's hard to know. Mm. <laughs> nods. Okay, good, good, good. I'll just mute myself. Actually, no, maybe I'll talk to you while I do it or you might disappear. Okay. So the first one is, can you read them to yeah. Number one. Okay. How can we? How can we learn to live in peace and cooperate? Hang on. With people of different views. Uh, and that's number one. Okay, number two is, how can we become clearer? Oh, yeah, this is a bit complicated. About Oops, our on. How can we become clearer, clearer about, about our motivation, motivation in addressing others? So, others. Let me explain that instead of write a long question in. So the idea here is that um, sometimes when we speak to people, we speak to them out of irritation or we speak to them to get what we want. Um, sometimes we even speak to people in a way that reinforces our separateness. Yeah, Kind of, you're like this, I'm like that. And, you know, in ways that don't kind of necessarily lead to mutual understanding or the sense of um, uh, connection, right? And part of this is knowing what we say, when and how. <laughs> So how do we decide this? You know, how do we decide how much to say, what to say, and what is really driving our speech? So, I mean, it doesn't have to be just speech. It can be the way we relate to others, but it's just like learning how to really listen in and, and get clearer about our motivations. Does that make sense? Yeah. And of course, you can go off at a tangent as well. Okay. And the last one's probably more straightforward. Uh, what do you think are the foundations upon which equitable yeah. society is built? Equitable society is built. All right. So you've got three questions. And hopefully, even when you're in your groups, you'll see them in the chat, I think. Um, again, if anybody does want to hang back, we can just kind of have a little chat together or something. Um, but I really encourage this. And if you're feeling a bit of resistance or trepidation, just feel into that and be kind to it and see if you can allow yourself to just uh, be open to connecting. You can be quiet. You don't have to contribute very much, but just allow it to be natural. And you may be surprised at the uh, the richness of the conversation. Okay, so we'll give you, I think, a good fifteen minutes. Is that does that sound good? Fifteen minutes, yeah. And then we'll come back in and we'll have a discussion as a group. So yeah, we have three monastics today, and for those who have just come back, you can now see Aya Satya, which is lovely. Uh, it just has a lovely impression, doesn't it? To see lots of seminars. <laughs> I love to see that on the screen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, welcome to those who just arrived. I think Diana's just joined us from Massachusetts. So you're meeting Emily again, which is lovely. Uh, have you met together? No, not yet. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone new, else new has joined, but we're a slightly bigger group now. Uh, oh, um, Sunma Kama Sopa can't unmute. That's probably because we need to give you the signal to unmute. Hopefully you could unmute in your rooms, otherwise you'd have come back earlier, <laughs> right? You could unmute, right? <laughs> good, good. Okay, so if you would like to contribute, um, Sunma, should we call you Sunma? Is that right? Do you want to nod or shake? Or, or let me just unmute you to check. I don't want to <laughs> guess you wrongly. Hi. Hi. How, how should we address you? You can call me Sopa. Sopa, okay. All right, super. So now is the time to feedback. Would anyone from any of the groups like to share what uh, you thought about or talked about or any particular insights that you had? Mm 
<laughs> or did you actually not unmute and have any conversation? <laughs> How about we do one group at a time? Yeah, but we're waiting for them to. <clears throat> Who would like to go first? Yeah, Emily? Hi. I'll come and unmute you. Hang on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I loved with meeting with my group of three or group of four, including myself. And I've been I've been with you all for now a few years and I never unmute because I'm painfully shy. And I'm I'm muting now just because I feel a little bit more brave after really feeling like I just really met three people that I've kind of been with for a while. So anyway, it's just a personal reflection that I was just so happy to be in that little small group. It was really so and we we had a good conversation about trying to integrate ways to communicate with people. And so we had a we had a lovely discussion too, and it was very personable. So it was nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Anyone else like to share? Mm. Otherwise, I should come to you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Hello. Hi. Um, yes, no, I very similarly um, found that very good. So I sort of went into it a little bit. I'm a bit tired and wasn't sure and um it was a really nice group and it was quite inspiring hearing what other people do um and and these conversations just make you think oh yeah maybe I should do that or oh yeah I have done that before and we were you know the reflections overall I would say well, you know, how useful this book is, how it can be used. It's very practical. And I gave the example for, it's easier for me to say about my experience, how you can use the index. So there was a period where, for example, I had a, there were lots of emotions and it was a difficult period. And I found this book really useful to say, maybe I felt angry and look up what to do with anger or write speak, like, what do I do now? I feel really emotional. I feel like I've got to say something. How do I do this? And uh, as someone else in the group mentioned, you know, that's sit sitter about right speech and, and like you mentioned, all the right time, truthful intent, all these things. Um, so, yeah, overall, I would say that it was a um, really inspiring conversation. It was sort of it's uplifted me. Um, and, you know, the book, again, is great. And I, I need to use it a bit more. I've, I've, I've drifted away a little bit other than coming to this yeah yeah thank you thank you yeah you'll be able to use it soon with a new person as well <laughs> you're when a little bit more when yes, yes. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> lovely uh Kedwin, can we come to you yes thank you venerable and I wanted to say that I also am a bit shy and when there are breakout groups, I want to leave mm -hmm. uh, because I get and feel intimidated. And I was thinking, so why is it that I can talk in the bigger group and why is it harder to be in a small group? Like why, why is that a fearful thing for me? And I thought, oh, it's because people are like responding to me and it's like, we're looking directly at each other. And I just find that a little intimidating and, I just decided to go with it, even though I felt a little nervous. And uh, we had such a wonderful group. And I'm so grateful that I decided, made that decision to go. So um, um, it was really nice to meet people that, you know, I see on screen and, and uh, you know, don't really get to talk to very much, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, even though it felt intimidating at first, so. Um, thank you for your wisdom, Venerable, and putting us in small groups together. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks for your courage to, um, yeah, have that anxiety and move into it rather than away. It's not always the right thing to do. You know, sometimes we have to respect those feelings, but quite often in a group like this, especially when we've been together for so long, you know, and we are hopefully 
somewhat aligned in our right views and motivations and general um, principles around speech and the way we relate to one another, it can be really enriching. So that's great. Really happy to hear that. And there'll be another chance if anyone's coming to the VASAC, we'll meet there too. Probably just more for a chat than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Would anyone else like to speak? Be really nice to hear other people. John. Hmm. Oh, Melanie, super. <laughs> Hi, Melanie. Hi, Venerable Walls. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's um, it was great to have the opportunity to talk with. Um, other people interested in Dharma and people of life seen some of them for a long time. And especially um, every time I find that we all have the same um, difficulties or the same, uh, uh, well, how can I say that? Not problems, but we, we sometimes the, the reaction and I said, oh, no, I shouldn't do that this and I should behave differently I should know better and when we talk uh, I realized that not everyone but most of us we have the same reaction and it's mm -hmm. it's due to condition and it's due to routines and and we are trying hard and I think we are training and we are getting better at it. And we were talking with uh, with Sean and Suzanne, and I had this feeling also when we were sharing. And it's so so useful and uplifting. Mm -hmm. And and this book helped me a lot because it's full of practical um, suttas. And I agree with Sean that it's. Uh, I should read it more often. Mm. So thank you yeah. for uh, for all those sutta discussion for I don't know how many years. <laughs> thank you. Years, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's a good point, isn't it? That the book continues. You know, it's not that now we've done it, we can put it in the bookshelf and move on to something better, deeper, more profound. This is your daily life practice, as Ben Lupeka said. It's um, the way we apply these basic principles in our dealings with one another. And, uh, yeah, I really relate to that point you made. Hi, Filippo. Hi. <laughs> Let's say hello to Filippo. Lovely to see you. Yeah, the point you made about um, realizing that essentially we're all working on this together in our own little lives, but actually it's not just our own isolated life. It's... Uh, we're dealing with the very human problems which are universal and I think that's the beauty of right view that's what turns you know there is suffering to something liberating to realize there is suffering and suffering is universal right it's um something everybody experiences and so the remedy has to be universal you know the Dhamma wouldn't be the Dhamma if it only applied to some it's the Dhamma because it's universal and um relevant to everybody human mind is human mind <laughs> as they say in india i think Gwenkichi probably said that human mind is human mind but it's true you know it's mm -hmm. it's the mind not my mind and it's conditioned like you say yeah it reminds me when i was in india that was one of the most powerful practices for me was serving retreats you know having been with my own mind for 10 days 30 days 45 days not even looking up or around me <laughs> um you can get a little bit self-focused if you like even though you're realizing there's nothing much in there but still it's about me and my path right mm. but then when you actually serve and you realize that everybody goes through just what you go through <laughs> just different um types and variations of the same theme that really helps to expand the perspective and take that sense of it being about me, you know, and my problem. Um, yeah, beating oneself up takes that out. Yeah. <laughs> Diana. Um, I guess I, I'd like to share just how 
kind of amazed I am from from reading all those excerpts in the book to just think about how those people were living so long ago, two and a half thousand years ago, 2,600, whatever it is now. And um, they had a lot of the same problems that we have. Like the, the name of the book is about social harmony and social harmony is so hard to achieve. People often get in conflict and groups get in conflicts and family members get in conflicts and Sangha members get in conflicts. It's just kind of part of the experience of being a human being. And isn't it amazing that all of those detailed examples were recorded or initially just memorized? And and then, I mean, you would never see that today in a group, I don't think, having, you know, I mean, think of the number of books if we're building up a shelf. This is just condensed. So I really feel grateful to the Buddha and to the Dhamma, to the whole tradition for, um, you know, making a point of addressing those things that are going to be applicable probably forever. And I, I agree with everyone else who says, I need to look at that book more. I think everybody needs to, <laughs> you know, we all need to. The world isn't getting along very well. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and there's got to be better ways to work things out than just trying to annihilate your enemy. <laughs> right. So, Bhikkhu Bodhi did a good job selecting, and thank you so much for everybody here for coming and all the weeks that I was able to come and to Venerable Chanda and Pekka for leading these discussions. It's I'm looking forward to the next book, but this one was a really good choice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it was really nice. Really, really nice. Kind of quite epic, really. For me, it was the first time I was bringing the Buddha's teachings to the Zoom groups, mm-hmm. as in directly. I mean, of course, there were lots of Buddha's teachings in all the talks and references, and, you know, it's all based around that. But, uh, yeah, to actually just read directly from the Buddha's words and to discuss together and bring it to life, to real-life situations, it's uh, quite a special thing. So hopefully, as we move forward, we'll do the same with whatever text we choose, but it will be less of an academic study and more of a kind of um, engaged and applicable kind of uh, study of the text that uh, can really help us in our lives. Mm. Yeah. Might not be quite so geared towards social harmony, but it's maybe more geared towards the personal training section. You know, most of the sutras are geared towards that. Um, And, of course, the two reinforce each other. We can't have equitable or harmonious societies without doing our own inner work. So, yeah, thank you for being part of it all this time. Hopefully our time differences are less now, so you'll be able to come along to the next groups. Three hours closer. Yeah. <laughs> Is it four now or five hours different? Five from you, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything else anyone would like to say before we um, perhaps discuss where to go next in these groups? Is there anything else? From anyone, including the nuns. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like to say three words, which is sa, sa, sa done a great thing by reading these texts together and I have really enjoyed it so much which is why I continued them even though um really I have enough to do now and <laughs> running the monastery but that's easy the day-to-day which is the scene part of it is the, actually a very small part of it but the whole behind the scenes but still I find these so valuable and so um, insightful for myself it's not something that I feel I need to lead. I only need to lead through reading the Buddha's words. And uh, I learn so much from each and every one of you. So I really want to um, just express that appreciation for how you've um, contributed and how you live your lives. You know, the sincerity with which you try to apply these teachings. And um, 
the honesty with which everybody relates their struggles and very human struggles, as Diana said, you know, very um, um, universal struggles, but all of us with a different, um, a slightly different experience, which is personal to us. So thank you for being good companions. And um, yeah, what do you think? Shall we? I don't know if I'm going to probably can do one next week. Just it's my um, I'm going up to see my family next week and I'm traveling on the 25th. So I'm not quite sure it might be an evening with them. Can you do one next week? 25th. Right? Yeah. 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 It depends on what to do. Well, you can choose, I guess. Could be a mystery <laughs> sutta. A mystery sutta. Could be a mystery sutta to get the uh, the suttas going. Maybe we'll discuss it because it may be that any of the other suttas will take several weeks. So it might be good to um, have some ideas. But if anybody here has suggestions, I can't promise we'll um, follow through. But it would be interesting to know where your interest lies, like, the suttas are huge, okay? So you've got the Majjhima Nikaya, the Anguttara, which are the threes, the fours, the whatever, the collected uh, discourse, sorry, the um, numerical discourses based around uh, usually how many points are made in a particular sutta. And then you've got the Samyutta Nikaya, which is the themed discourses, um, one of my personal favorites which there are many very deep and rich suttas on really the nature of existence to a large degree. Causality, these are my favorites, causality. <laughs> and um, the senses and, uh, well, really Nidana and Kanda Samyutta are my favorites. So we're not going to go through a whole Samyutta, but we could take particular suttas. Um, then there's the cardinal suttas, the first ones the Buddha spoke about. And I want to see what Manoi has to say. But feel free to write anything in the chat as well. If you have um, questions or things not to do. Maybe there are things you wouldn't want us to do. Just a small question, Venerable. Oh. Um, when you are doing the sutta, uh, you, will you be doing it from those big books of um, Bhikkhu Bodhi or will it be Sutta Central Bandha ah, Jato? Good question. I probably would incline to Bhikkhu Bodhi, partly because I like reading books. Um, but it would be interesting. I don't know if I'll have time to do that, but if anybody else had another translation, that could be interesting too. You know, if anybody else wants to go through it with Bhikkhu Bod uh, uh, Sajato's translation, then that could throw a different angle on things. Sometimes the translation's different. Um, yeah, I mm. probably would go with the book. What do people think about that? Ah, I'd like to look at some of the verse suttas from the Sutta Nipata. Okay, mm. that's mm. probably my least favorite thing to do. Mm. <laughs> but we can probably put one or two in. I mean, it's probably my least favorite simply because they're usually later and they're more dubious in that sense to be ascribed to the Buddha. Not all, not all, but to find out which are and which are not. And there's some strange ones that can be sometimes a little bit misleading as well. Um, but it's possible. We could do that. I mean, maybe Venerable Pekka might have one that she likes. I'd rather start with some from the others. But I think, yeah, actually, it's nice that you've mentioned that because mm. it shouldn't be entirely dismissed. We can weave that in as well. Thank you. And Diana's got Majima but hasn't started. And why, I wonder, because one of the things about the suttas is finding a, a, a route in, right? So what we're trying to do with this, I think, is to try and find some ways in that can then be almost like a starting point for us to have our own investigation into the suttas. I mean, another thing is themes. You know, there are different suttas, say, on metta, different suttas on um, restlessness, whatever. You can look up themes in the back of books. Um, let's have a look. You can order a printed version. That's true, you can. We actually do have a printed version of Banta Sajato. So I guess that's my habit to go to Bhikkhu Bodhi. I've hardly opened the printed versions from Banta Sajato. I just prefer Bhikkhu Bodhi, honestly. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's possible I could have that parallel or someone else could. I think it's nicer to involve someone else. We might like to do that. Do you have them, Melanie? 
No. Uh, those thematics that just sound interesting and whatever spa inspires you is that will come across and make it more enjoyable for all. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. That's true. It'll also make me motivated. <laughs> uh, the Buddha's discourses with theories. What do they oh, teddies, teddies. The Buddha's disc. Yeah, the um, terigata. Yeah, the terigata. Yeah, spelled with T H. Um, yeah, that is an idea. Although again, it's not such as proper. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, we're basically talking about everything that exists here. <laughs> so I was hoping for something maybe a specific mm. sutta that somebody might be interested in. But I guess that makes it quite wide. Shall we stay with Bikapodis? And if we know what's the next sutta, someone could compare with another translation. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I have to leave goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Lovely to see you, Mel uh, Emily. Uh, see you next time, hopefully. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's a lot to go on and hasn't mm -hmm. made me any wiser as to what to choose next week. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll think about it. Or maybe Venerable Pekka will think about mm -hmm. it. And uh, perhaps even two of the nuns could talk about mm -hmm. it together. I can tell you my favorite. Oh, oh. Yeah. What is your favorite? I'm interested. It's the the Data Vibhanga Sutta. Ah, Data Vibhanga. Especially mm -hmm. uh, introducing the backstory with mm -hmm. Venerable Pukusati, how okay. he came across the Buddha as the leftist palace oh. with the king. Wow. Okay. And even before that, how there were seven those seven monks who went to the top of the hill oh, down that the ladder. And he was one of those seven. Okay. Really. Yeah. Remind us what state is it? What, what state is it? We haven't got time now, Venerable. It's time to wind up. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the thing is, whatever sutta we choose, it's going to be several sutta classes. So it has to be something that there's like that we want to go on with that I want to go on with. Okay, I'll be honest. Um, because I, I reckon it'll take 10 sessions because this is a discussion group, as we're saying, not a kind of sutta class. So, um, we'll have a think about it and come back to you. All right, so hopefully, we'll see some of you next week. Um, and take it from there. So, Manoi, do you want to? Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it is so nice to see three nuns in the screen, in the same screen. And uh, thank you very much for the teachings. And uh, so we have to say uh, goodbye for Bhikkhu Bodhi's social yes, and so lovely book today. And, uh, and uh, so, but we will continue with these things. And as you know, these sutta discussion and the lovely breakout rooms and the community and a lot of others, the teachings that Anukampa and Venerable Chanda is doing is offered on donation basis. All these regular teachings are there in the YouTube as well. And this is uh, funded by the charity and the charity is funded by all of you, all of the community the generosity of the community. So if you can afford, um, this is an invitation um, to uh, donate anything that you can afford. Um, there is a donate link in the Anukampa Bikuni project uh, website and uh, you can donate. And uh, if you are able, you can do a standing order as well. So from this money, we... We can maintain the monastery as well as continue the teachings and the give a chance um, for the future um, um, a bhikkhunis to, you know, be future new bhikkhunis to come and uh, teach us and the next generations as well. And other than that, um, you if you want to do any other, in you know, if you want to involve in any other way, you can contact team at anukampaproject.org you want to give a food dana or a supermarket delivery that can be done as well contact team at ankampa project.org and uh, you can you can select you can you can talk to them what you what you want to do and there is a calendar of the dana available days as well dana means the food deliveries you can do that remotely as well. And also there is another one called needed items. You can contribute to that as well. So that's all the nice ways that you can contribute and to make this happening in the future. 
and uh, and and you can you can check the events page in the anukampa project org. There's there's several events listed. There's uh, venerable chandas uh, retreats, events, talks, and uh, Ajahn Brahmali's um, UK visit and the and the talks, and also the online retreat by Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Brahm, that is also there, uh, you can see. And I'm not sure whether there's any spaces for the 2nd June and the Vesak day, but you can see that as well. One good thing, one reliable thing that you can get all this information, uh, to those topics, um, subscribe to the newsletter, and then you get all the links and what is happening, um, all those things in the newsletters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it's good to subscribe to the newsletter. It's also good to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Matthias has told me that in the past and we've forgotten to keep telling you. But the more people subscribe, apparently the more it comes up on people's searches, something like that. So there's lots of teachings going to be coming on there soon from all my um, retreats all over the place. <laughs> the Meta Retreat in America, the Norway Retreat and... Um, uh, the retreat in Oxford last week and also tomorrow it's on death and dying in Bristol and uh, yeah there's two more places for a half day retreat I haven't said there but that's here that's here at Anukampa Grove so if you are local-ish I don't suppose you're coming from Massachusetts but <laughs> if you're local-ish you could come along for that um, so that's a different way of registering um, yeah I guess you'd have to register within the next week. There's lots of places for the BASAC. Okay. The online BASAC from 4 till 6 p.m. BST UK time. All right. So we'll say goodbye and thank you once again and see you very soon. Bye, Filippo. It's lovely to see you. It was so nice to have you visit. It was so nice. And your card, your beautiful card. <laughs> Shall we unmute everybody? You can wave goodbye. <laughs>